Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9 together. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, that is, we want you to be aware of, to perceive, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of the others, uh, excuse me, of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know that, excuse me, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. I want to bring a sermon I call The Paradox of Christ. The Paradox of Christ. I'm going back about a little over four years. I've preached this before, but that equates to about 190 sermons ago. So, the paradox of Christ. A paradox is a statement that seems to express or convey two contrary ideas, and yet both ideas can be true. Um, it's like saying the actress loves the admiration of her fans, but she also worries about her personal security. Both ideas can be true. One rabbi wrote a book called The Paradox of Anti-Semitism. While some try to destroy the existence of the Jew, their persecutions of Jewish people only cement their closeness with one another. It, it uh, reinvigorates their intention, their desire to stay alive, to survive in the face of trouble and persecution in the world. It has the opposite effect. It actually strengthens their resolve. A father spanks his son and he says, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. That seems paradoxical. It certainly hurts the kid's backside when he receives it, but it wounds the father's heart even more when he has to give it, when he has to administer it. That's paradoxical. In this section of 2 Corinthians 8, the Apostle Paul says that Christians in Macedonia were both rich and poor simultaneously. Verse 2 tells us, their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. They were poor in money and goods, but they were rich in their willingness to give what they did have. That's paradoxical. We could all think of someone who's just the opposite. They may be wealthy in goods and, and money, but they're stingy. They're tightwads when it comes to their acts of charity to other people. And there's a great admonition for all Christians there in verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything in faith, that they were trusting God, and utterance, they were speaking up for God, and knowledge, they were learning about God from the Scriptures, and in all diligence, they weren't lazy to work and do something for God, and in your love to us, that is Paul and his companions, See that ye abound in this grace also. That was concerning the giving of money to those less fortunate. There are many other graces in the Christian life, not listed in the Bible. But it certainly takes the grace, that is the kindness of God, um, for you to give financially to the work of the ministry 
uh, where the needs are to be found and where they can best be met. Just as the church in Macedonia gave out of their own their joy uh, in Christ, so Paul desired that the Corinthians would do the same here in these two letters he wrote to them. But I want to take up the subject of what I call the paradox of Christ, as seemingly contrary statements or ideas about him, which were and are both true simultaneously. He says at, at verse 9, uh, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. That's a paradoxical statement. Uh, so I'm going to give you nine examples, God willing, if you want to take notes. And let's jump right into it. Example number one, or paradox number one, he hungered, yet he was able to feed multitudes. Both ideas are true in the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, verses 1 and 2 say, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. Yet the scripture tells us later, Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as many as they would. John 6, verses 10 and 11. He fed multitudes with a handful of loaves and a few fish. The Lord Jesus hungered, and yet he was able to feed multitudes of people. That's part of the paradox of Christ. You might think, well, why would he, the Son of God, allow himself to be hungry in that way? We'll come to that eventually. But example number two, he thirsted, yet he offers the water of life. During his crucifixion, we read, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst, John 19, verse 28. Yet he told the woman at the well, in John 4, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life, John 4, verse 14. As a man... Jesus hungered and thirsted, yet he offers the water of life to those who will turn to him as sinners needing his forgiveness. This is also part of the paradox of Christ. Example number three is this. He grew weary, yet he is our rest. John 4 verse 6 states, now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. But he told his followers later, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. In 1933, there was a, a Christian songwriter named Paul White. And I think he captured a lot of this in one of his songs called Jesus, Wonderful Lord. Weary, yet he is the world's only rest. Hungry and thirsty, with plenty, has blessed. Tempted, he promises grace for each test. Jesus, Wonderful Lord. In his flesh, Christ grew tired and weary, just as you do, just as I do. He was subject to the limitations of a human body and a, and a body of flesh and blood, flesh and human body, like anyone else would be. We tend to forget that when we think of the Lord Jesus. We tend to forget that he was not only God, but he was fully man in human form. He was born into the world of human parents. When he was a baby, he had to have his diaper changed. When he was full, he had to go to the bathroom. He had to take a bath. He had to brush his teeth if they brush their teeth in those days, and uh, all the other elements that come along with being a fully human being. Yet he was nevertheless God in human form. That's a paradox in itself. He grew weary, yet he is our rest. Paradox number four, he paid tribute or tax 
yet he is the king of kings. What does he have? Or what does he need that you and I can give him? He has everything. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? Where's the place of my rest? Nothing. Nowhere. Yet he paid taxes. He told Simon Peter, notwithstanding, lest we should offend him as the authorities, go thou to the sea, and cast in hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. When thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Well, Jesus could do that. I, I can't do that, right? Go out to the street, you'll find a lost wallet. There'll be just enough money in there to pay your income taxes this year, and it doesn't work out that way, unfortunately. And um, give unto them for me and thee, Matthew 17, verse 27. He said later, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, Matthew 22, verse 21. The Jews had no liberties in their day, like you and I enjoy. But Christ, by example, said they should still pay their taxes. I got to thinking the other day, and I was telling a, a good friend of mine about this, that Jehovah's Witnesses are some of the biggest hypocrites in the world. I'm writing a new article for John Davis over in England, uh, Things I Have Learned So Far. And that's one of the things I've learned, that Jehovah's Witnesses are some of the biggest hypocrites in the world. They don't give any allegiance to the flag of their country, and they don't join the military to defend that country. But they'll sure pay their income taxes to finance that country and finance those public schools. And they'll take advantage of every tax benefit that government might give them, if possible. If they were truly consistent, saying, we don't want to support any kingdom that might be in conflict with Jehovah's kingdom, they'd be the most anti-income tax religion in the world to be consistent, but they're not. They only pick and choose those things that make it look like they're taking a bold stand, but they're really not. But no one likes paying their income taxes. Nevertheless, the Lord Jesus said you ought to. The Bible says when Christ returns in power and glory, quote, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, verse 16. The Apostle Paul wrote, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. It does seem paradoxical that, uh, uh, of Jesus Christ that here on the earth he paid tribute or taxes and yet he's the king of kings. All rulers, all monarchs, all emperors, all presidents, all politicians or anyone in leadership authority in the world one, will one day bow down themselves to him in submission and in fear. Paradox number five, Jesus prayed, and yet he hears our prayers. We read in Matthew 26, verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And yet he tells the disciples, John 14, verses 13 and 14, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. It's tempting to ask and wonder if he can answer our prayers, why did he need to pray? We'll come to that in a little while. That's part of the paradox of Christ. He prayed, yet he hears the prayers of Christians. Both things are accepted as true at the same time in the life and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paradox number six, he wept, yet he dries our tears. The shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, simply says, Jesus wept. Not like the disgusting 
New World Translation of the JWs, Jesus gave way to tears. They take two words and expand it into five, and two, three syllables and expand it into six. They just butcher the king's English like nobody's business. Luke 19.41 says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. However, the Bible promises, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. I'm looking forward to that day. Now, clearly that time hasn't arrived yet, but as a man, as one with a heart of compassion for lost men, Jesus wept over them. As a heart of compassion for the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish nation, he wept over it. This is, too, part of the um, paradox of Christ. Example number seven. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, and yet he is the redeemer of the world. He was sold, and yet he well, one was able to redeem the entire world spiritually by his own death on Calvary. Matthew 26, verse 15, tells us about Judas betraying the Lord Jesus to those who wanted to arrest him, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. But when it comes to him redeeming the sinful race of men, the Bible says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, um, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Jesus Christ's whereabouts, where they could find him, were sold by Judas for 30 pieces of silver to his enemies. Help them to apprehend Jesus in the garden. But it accomplished very little else that night. Christ was resolved with the Heavenly Father to go to Calvary. He came into this world to die for the sake of sinners. He knew it was coming. Judas agonized later over what he had done. He went, later went out and hanged himself because of it. And uh, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Yet by his death, he offers redemption from the, the consequence of sin to everyone who will put their trust in him. I'm glad I've trusted him. I'm glad that as a little boy, I was fortunate enough to hear the gospel preached and had enough good sense as a small child to realize if everyone has sinned, that includes me. I didn't know much about sin. I was six years old, but I knew I had disobeyed my dad and my mom. And if that qualified as sin, then I was guilty. And if God had a right to judge sinners, that included me. And I didn't want him to judge me. I didn't want to go to hell when I died. And so I walked a short distance to the pulpit here and in front of the pulpit. And the best way I knew how, the best way I could, I just cried to God, forgive me, forgive me. And uh, it's been a, tr a tremendous blessing because it's just as real in my mind now, um, 52 years later, as if it happened two weeks ago. And it's never faded since that time, and I hope that it never does. But what we call thrift stores now, these to refer to as redemption stores. Something gets cast off as though it had no more use to the former owner. Somebody else comes by and sees it and says, hey, I can still use that. And they buy it and put it to good use once again. And in a way, that's what God did for you. You were cast off because of your sin. You had alienated yourself from the fellowship with God because of your sin inherited from Adam all the way down. And yet God saw something in you. Don't ask me why, but he saw something in you. He said, that person's worth redeeming. I'll shed my blood for him, for her. I can still use that person that will trust in me. Paradox number eight. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And yet he is the good shepherd. The prophet Isaiah wrote, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, 
so he openeth not his mouth, Isaiah 53, verse 7. 700 years before it took place, those words were written. The apostle Philip seemed to understand that when he witnessed to the Ethiopian on, uh, on, in Acts chapter 8, on the road to Damascus. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, John 10, 11, and other verses like that. Christ was both the lamb being offered for the sins of the world. He was also the one, the high priest offering the lamb. Both typologies found their fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. And, and as such, he is the good shepherd to effect your salvation through his, the shedding of his own blood and lead you safely to heaven. He said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me, John 10, 27. He's both the sheep and the shepherd. That's a paradox in the Lord Jesus Christ. He should, he, example number nine, we move on, example number nine. He was put to death, and yet he raises the dead. Think about that. The Lord Jesus was put to death at the hands of sinners, and yet, he has the power and possesses the authority to raise the dead one day. Do you know, in the Mormon religion, let's see if I can explain this clearly for you. It might help in your conversations in the future. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. The Apostle Paul says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not, why are they thus baptized for the dead? And the Mormon church has taken that verse and that one little word for, baptized for the dead. I've told you before, the little word for can go in two directions. You go to McDonald's or some fast food restaurant, you pay for the food before you eat it. If you go to a nice sit-down restaurant, you pay for it after you've eaten it. So for can be pushed or pulled in either direction. What the Mormons did, instead of looking forward to the future resurrection, which is what the whole chapter is about, because Christ rose, we hope to rise again, they pushed it backwards, saying, I'm being baptized on behalf of my ancestors, by proxy. They went in the wrong direction. They should have gone forward in anticipation of the future resurrection. The Oneness Church, Jesus Only Group, the, the United Apostolics, they do the same, same thing, Acts 2.38. Yeah. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. A text without its, without its context is a pretext. And the entire context is Peter just preached about how they had killed the Prince of Life. By wicked hands ye have taken and crucified and slain. And the other Jews hearing this said, men and brethren, what shall we do? In light of the fact that we just killed our Messiah, what should we do? And churches like the one up the street and others who believe with him say, you should get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, or Jesus only, for the remission of sins in order to get them, your sins remitted. In that case, they pushed it forward where they should have gone backwards. In light of past remissions, and your response to God was to rebel and sin against him, now that Christ has come and you murdered him, this is what you ought to do. Get baptized and admit once and, once and for all you were wrong as a nation and receive him as your Messiah. They pushed in the wrong direction. He was put to death, and yet he raises the dead. John 19, verse 33 says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Earlier in his ministry, not only did Jesus have power to bring dead, the dead back to life, and he did this numerous, numerous times. The widow of Nain's son, Luke 7, Lazarus in John chapter 11, and uh, Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. He raised at least three people back to life from the dead that we're told about. But he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Yeah. They're going to hear his voice. The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. John 5, verse 25. One of the longest chapters in the New Testament 
and I alluded to it a minute ago, is 1 Corinthians 15. The entire chapter is on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and our hope of rising from the dead because we know him and are trusting in him. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. He was put to death, yet he promises to raise the dead. These are a few examples of what I call the paradox of Christ today. Both statements seem self-contradicting, yet they're both true. You may still be thinking about that first question. Why would the Lord Jesus allow himself to hunger? Why would he allow himself to be tired and thirsty and go through all of those hardships uh, in human life? Well, if you call upon God and cry out to God in your times of trouble and suffering and hardship and difficulties and ask and beg and plead God to intercede, to help you out, God can't very well say to you, I understand. I know what you're going through. If he's never gone through anything. But through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can now say, I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be uh, thirsty. I know what it is to be tired. I know what it is to be spat upon and to be mocked and cursed and ridiculed. I know what it is to be rejected by the religious leaders who should have known better. I know what it is to be rejected by my own family and friends, my closest friends. I know what it is to have them all forsake me in my darkest hours. I know what it is to be tempted by the devil when my flesh is weak. The devil knows exactly how to hit you, when to hit you. When you're weak, that's when he offers temptation like you've never known before. But through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can now say, I understand these things. The Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, verse 15. This is the paradox of Christ. He was the creator, yet he entered into his creation in order to identify with men and redeem them from the consequences of their own sin, their own disobedience, their own foolishness and uh, act of free will against God. You have no other friend that loves you like the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. You have no one else who's ever loved you the way Jesus Christ has loved you. And no one else who's ever been qualified to do what he did for you, to suffer on your behalf, to take your sins upon himself, to die as a substitute for you. And I'm so glad that I know him. I'm glad that I've trusted him to be my savior and the forgiver of my sins. And through him, I have confidence that when this life is over, I'm going to wake up in heaven with him. I can't, look, I can't wait for that day to come. 